Professor Ian Plymer. He is here. Uh, he is a man who's knowledge of and comments on climate change, I really respect. And then later on in the morning before midday, Dr. John Bruni. Uh, there's enough to talk about there. Ukraine, Putin, submarines, helicopters. Oh, yes, helicopters. <laughs> I sometimes wonder who is in charge of buying all of this stuff and, and uh, why we seem to always end up being the bunnies. I don't know. I must admit, uh, Professor Plymer walked through the door. He sort of looked at the, at the dining room table with a degree of disbelief. <laughs> yeah, I agree, sir. It is an unusual thing to see. Well, the last time I was with you was in your garage. Yes, I know. I have a bit surrounded of... Surrounded by wonderful old cars. Yeah. And it was winter. Yes. It was a bit chilly up the end of the garage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the lights for the cameras made life a bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to do the radio station concept in the garage, but then because it's got this great big uh, cement roof and you've got Wi-Fi problems and it yes, uh, yes. wasn't exactly wasn't exactly practical. Well, you're not the only one. I did a segment with Andrew Bolt a couple of weeks ago on Sky TV. Yeah. And he's got the fourth bedroom in his house, yeah. kitted out as a studio. Yes, yes. Guy had put in a 12.5 KVA generator in case the power goes. <laughs> They've increased his internet. Uh, so I don't think you're the only one. And in today's world, it works like that. Just before I came here, I was doing a, a podcast with a chap in Panama, in Panama City. Uh -huh. And it looked as if that was being done from the lounge room or the kitchen yeah. uh, with a library there. So uh, it's a wonderful modern world. We don't have to go into studios. We don't have to put on makeup, which is very important for radio. <laughs> yeah, but they, when, you, when you think of the money that people have spent, hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes on radio licenses, this thing which is a license to print money, they don't tell you, of course, it's also a license to lose money if oh, you don't yes. oh, do yes. it properly. But there you are, you've got your service area, and they tell you exactly what you, what you, uh, to whom you are broadcasting. Well, uh, print and television and radio are now on a spiral. Yeah. With some television stations, it's a death spiral. It certainly is. The competition is, is enormous. Yeah. And you can, you can call up anything. I can, I can be calling up something now yes. in, that's happening in Canada or in, yeah. or in the US or in the UK. On that uh, mobile phone that you on have there. On the mobile phone. There are 200... off and put away. But uh, 200,000 radio stations, if you've got that... Uh, uh, um, Andy Martin, Professor Plymer. Hi. Uh, how many radio stations would you reckon that'd be on the average mobile telephone? Oh. Uh, I heard 200,000. Yeah. You could get any anyone anywhere in the world. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's five million podcasts in the world. Yeah, but so how, how five million podcasts? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm using a very ancient ABC microphone here now. Yeah, I used to listen to the ABC. Yeah. And I used to watch the ABC, but I gave up about twenty years ago. Yeah. I'm a great lover of classical music. I don't listen to ABC FM Classic. Why? Because. They flapped their lips about how wonderful this piece of music was and how well it was performed, and it wasn't. Yeah. So what I do is I listen to Radio Swiss Classic, yeah. and I get it, get it on the phone. I can get it on my, my iPad or my uh, yep. computer. And you won't be reminded that you're listening to it from Ghana land. Uh, well, whatever it is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> can I offer you a, a cup of green tea or and a cup of proper tea? A cup of tea on the way coming. Uh, yeah, it's a, that's a, good. A cup of tea that's... Uh, it's stirred, stirred clockwise. clockwise. Good. <laughs> Good. I'm sure there is a scientific reason for no, it. No, there isn't. <laughs> if, but if you ask for that in Germany, they'll do it. Really? You, yeah, yeah. If you ask for it in England, they won't. They'll stir it the other way. Just to be nasty. Uh, no, just to be English. <laughs> <laughs> I'm often... I'm, it's interesting that you're, uh, you're doing the thing on Sky. Uh, it strikes me as being so strange... To have a man like you with your knowledge and insight into this very topical thing called uh, climate change, and yet I don't see you being quoted a lot or interviewed a lot. Is that Could that possibly be because you are not sort of going down the rabbit hole that they want you to go down? Well, quite. Uh, I had uh, Liz Gore about 10 years ago ask me to appear 
on Radio National. And I, and I said, look, I'm not going to do Radio National. You can fit the audience into a telephone box. Secondly, it's going to be an ambush. <laughs> and thirdly, what's in it for me? So true, so and, true. Um, she said, well, you get paid by Sky, don't you? I said, yes, I do. And the arrangement is that virtually every time I appear on Sky, yeah. there's a chap up here in Nairn who grows Brussels sprouts. He just loves me. <laughs> and there's a box of Brussels sprouts left <laughs> in the driveway when he comes into town. Uh, That's perfect. my pay. And last week I did four Skies and uh, only got one box of Brussels sprouts, which I absolutely love. <laughs> so, uh, I don't get paid for it. I like the audience. I get a huge amount of feedback. As soon as I walk out of the studio, and I try to do it in the studio because you get better vision and better sound, as soon as I walk out, the phone starts going. Mm -hmm. So uh, people in much of rural Australia get sky as Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm free-to-air. People like Muggins here, we buy it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a wonderful network. I won't do the ABC. I do a lot on TGB, uh, which then goes to four... 4BC BC, yeah, and 3AW. And, uh, 3AW, yeah. uh, occasionally they're a bit in 5AA, and um, what's the Perth one, 6PR. Yeah, 6PR. Uh, but basically I've been banned. I've, I've had two universities cancel me. I've arranged to give talks here and they've cancelled them. I heard the Duke of Edinburgh once asked me to address the Royal Geographical Society at Buckingham Palace. The Mandarins got to him and he had to cancel it. On Monday night I read that on Facebook that my latest book called The Little Green Book uh, has had a fact check and has been shown to be fraudulent. (laughs) Now, on Monday night that book was being printed in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. They hadn't hadn't fact-checked it at all. They're just lying. (laughs) No, no, no. Why has it become such an incredibly political... Thing. It's it's uh, well, without it's, logic. Uh, it's because I'm upsetting the bandwagon of the unelected elite who have conned the left and who are skinning the public dry with this scare on climate change. And I was saying to my wife last night, I don't think in my life I've lived in a time where there's so much universal deceit, where there are so many lies where you cannot believe anything in the mainstream media, and this is why programs like this, podcasts, are now being listened to all around the world. But, but why, 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 why would people be conned into being shut up? Why would they be conned into not asking perfectly reasonable, pertinent questions which would get at the truth? Because we have two truths, my truth and your truth. But I wouldn't shut you up if I didn't agree with your truth, but these people want to shut you up. Well, I have a problem. I speak the truth and I use facts. And if you speak the truth, you never have to remember what you said. Yeah. And my facts can be checked and validated in the scientific literature. And because of that, I'm deemed controversial because I use facts. Now, my science, geology, we look back in time and we look at all the major processes, all the climate changes Mm. that we've undergone, And that doesn't fit in with the popular narrative, which is a biblical narrative, and that is where we have lived on a static earth and it's because we sinful humans have been here. We're making a change. And it's all due to us. And this is the residual Christianity that we have in society. It's been torn apart. Um, Christianity is almost dead, but we hang on to things like guilt, uh, penance, uh, Mm. indulgences, And I think the climate movement is one of these religions and it's like some of these fundamentalist religions. It's not too tolerant, it's not too forgiving and this fundamentalist religion is one that is is quite happy to cancel people or in previous times, such as in Lysenko's Soviet Union where he didn't use genetics, uh, people were killed. Uh, We're living, I think we're living towards the end of Western civilization. We are too wealthy. Uh, we're doing what people did in the late 1600s in the Dutch tulip craze where there was so much money people could spend two years' pay on one tulip bulb. Yeah. And um, eventually Holland, which was the richest country in the world, um, went bankrupt and became very, very poor. Now, we're doing exactly the same. We've lost Christianity. We've lost uh, an ethical framework to our society. We've got so much money 
And we ask the philosophical question, well, what does it all mean? Where do we come from? And they've embraced a new religion which has guilt and has repentance, and that is climate change. Mm. And we must take real action. We must take real action. Real action action on climate change. What are you supposed to do? What does real action look like? I don't know because you see these signs on people's fences, and I'll comment on the sign on your fence in a minute. (laughs) Um, You see signs on people's fences saying climate action now. Mm. But my question is, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. Are you going to stop using electricity, stop using your mobile phone? Mm. Are you going to stop travelling? Are you going to <laughs> stop having house heating, house cooling, cooking? Are you going to give up your refrigerator? What actually will you do that's tangible? Have they thought it through or made any attempt to think what the words actually mean? No, they haven't because what happens is we rely on a chant. Uh, like with the voice, we have a chant. It's the vibe. Yes. And that was a wonderful <laughs> film, uh, <laughs> The Castle. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. I mean, what creative people wrote a film about one subsection of the Australian Constitution? <laughs> well, isn't that fantastic? Yeah. And the voice has got nothing to do with the Australian Constitution, which is a document to show how we can have disparate and desperate states working together in a federation. Mm. It, it's It's... Who handles the fence? Who handles tax? Who handles education? Mm-hmm. Uh, do we have um, customs houses at borders? It has nothing to do with rights. It talks about the people. Mm. And I argue very strongly that this country has a voice. It's called Parliament. Mm-hmm. And everyone's vote is equal. Yeah. Well, it's not quite equal if you live in Tasmania and vote in the Senate. Yeah. Your, well, your vote is worth more than someone living in New South Wales and voting in the Senate. But, yeah. Um, we already have a voice. Yeah. And I also argue that I, as a geologist, I spend a lot of my time in the outback and you go to some pretty wild places. The town of Wilcannia in New South Wales is locally known as Will Kill You mm. for a very good reason. Yes. These are places of violence, uh, alcoholism, drugs, or women get beaten up. If you're a girl and get through to 15 years old and haven't been raped, you are very lucky. The voice is not going to solve any of that. No, no. So why are we having this? And really it's look over here, look over here. It's a diversion. Yeah, and while the economy is falling apart, while all of the measures that um, the leaders of the current government have wanted to put in for the last 30 years, why are they doing those? All by stealth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I like to see people's signs on their fences because it shows me whether they've thought about the issue or not. <laughs> and climate action now shows that uh, things are pretty vacuous mm. between the years. Well, uh, the reason that sign is on my fence is is that uh, to think about something as simplistic as, oh, all we need is a voice and all the problems will be oh, fixed. Yeah, tick that box, move on. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Now, um, you, you, you try to talk to somebody who is pro the voice about just exactly what that will do to help the uh, uh, infant mortality rate, the incarceration, the, the joblessness, the education. Violence, how will in, how will a voice? Because the government, the minister on the insiders, um, the other day. Shame on you watching the insiders. Oh, look! It, you it, should be watching the outsiders. It stimulates me. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me grist for my mill. Uh, well, yes. Thank you for doing the research, and it saves me having to watch. It. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> But the, the simple thing is she was going to uh, brief the voice, and I don't know whether it's half a dozen people or three dozen people, I don't know, but she was going to brief them on the things that she thought they should be talking about. So in other words, we've got the minister who will tell the voice so that the voice can tell the minister what the minister already knows but for some strange reason has done nothing about so if if she if she can fix these things when the voice tells her to fix these things, why hasn't she done it years ago? Exactly. Well, I, I think like a lot of people who get into senior p- political positions, they get distant from reality. They don't live in a world. They have no idea what's going on, and some of them end up with kangaroos in the top paddock. Yeah, some of them really do. And my next door neighbour up the mid north coast of New South Wales, I won't mention the town or the name. Um, he was once years ago um, one of her boyfriends. 
he's got some very interesting things to say about her. <laughs> All the seeds were sown then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Australia, when it's boiled down, is a pretty small place. Everybody knows most things yeah. about everybody. Well, this bloke's a bushy also, and yeah. uh, they don't take any rubbish. And he, he smelt it straight away. But come come back to the, the climate thing. Um, you know those ice core things that they put down in the Greenland, is it? Greenland, uh, the Gisp cores and the uh, Vostok cores in Antarctica, yeah. Here is an absolute demonstration of climate change and how over the millions and millions of years the climate has been changing. And it's not something you can argue about or take action against. It's just the inevitability of us being on the planet, isn't it? Those ice cores are fabulous because they... Give us a record of the past cycles of climate. Yeah. And the ice cores don't tell us this, but geology tells us that every 400 million years when we pull apart and stitch back together continents, we have a climate cycle. And we've been in one of those for quite a while. Antarctica just hasn't moved. It's plonked itself over the South Pole. Mm -hmm. And when it eventually breaks up and moves, we will have a massive climate change. Mm -hmm. So that's one cycle we see, a 400 million year cycle. What sort of participation would man have in that event? Um, nine parts of three-fifths of bugger all. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have another cycle which the astronomers and the isotope chemists are on to, and that is every 143 million years we have a very bad address in the galaxy and we get bombarded by cosmic rays. Mm. We have clouds form, we reflect light and heat. Mm. And someone got a research grant years ago to tour all of the art galleries of Europe looking at the landscape paintings mm. and measured the proportion of cloud in each of the paintings and was able to, from that, work out uh, the cloudiness, in other words, how much cosmic radiation the planet was getting hit. Mm. Then he spoke to a cosmic geochemist in, in Jerusalem who said, oh, yes, this is what I'm getting from measuring in old sediments. Perfect correlation. So we know that things out there in the cosmos drive climate. Mm. Then we get to the ice cores and we see that there are orbital changes. Now, we've known this for more than 100 years. A Serbian geophysicist calculated that every 100,000 years we get a cycle and 90,000 of those 100,000 years is when we're further from the sun and 10,000 of those um, 100,000 years were closer to the sun. Now, we're in one of those 10,000-year periods now, and that's called an interglacial between uh, glaciations. So we've got a 100,000-year cycle. We've got another cycle about 40,000 years when the Earth tilts its axis a little bit. And we've got another cycle about 20,000 years when the Earth wobbles like a top. So we've known this for 100 years. We can see it in the ice cores, and what we see in the ice cores is absolutely amazing. We see that climate change is extraordinarily rapid. We can have a 15 degree Celsius change in 10 years. What we also see in the ice cores is that every time the Earth has naturally warmed up, it is later that the carbon dioxide content increases. It's not carbon dioxide driving the climate. Mm. It's the climate driving carbon dioxide. So it's the exact inverse of what we've been told. Now, you've got a look of disbelief on your face. So... Go and get a bottle of champagne. It's uh, morning time. It's a good time for one? champagne. <laughs> now, get a bottle of champagne. I can do a glass of red. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I've got to have a drink that is effervescent. <laughs> I don't have such soft drink. Uh -huh. So as it's warming up, mm. the bubbles keep coming. And that's because we've known about this in chemistry for only about 150 years, and that is that carbon dioxide and water have an inverse solubility. So as your champagne warms up, the carbon dioxide comes out of solution and keeps bubbling. Now, that's what happens in the oceans. As the oceans are warming up, you're releasing carbon dioxide. So you have a natural period of warming, and then later the oceans start to warm up, and then later we have carbon dioxide come into the atmosphere. So what we see now is currently an increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the question has never been answered. What proportion of this is human mm. and what proportion is due to degassing from the oceans? But it's worse than never been answered. It's never been asked. Well, I ask three questions all the time. The first one is, can you please show me that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming? Mm. I've asked that question for 25 years. 
I sit on a board with a former chief scientist. I've asked him that question. He can never answer it. He just obfuscates. And so uh, here we are, the absolute fundamental, the whole climate change mantra, and the, the question hasn't been answered. But the supplementary question is the killer. Well, 3% of all emissions are human, 97% is natural. So if the 3% of emissions drive global warming, why don't the 97%? And they can't answer it. Mm. And then the third one is the one we discussed about the inverse solubility of carbon dioxide. Show me, why is it that in ice cores we see a natural temperature increase Mm. and then 1,500 or more years later we get an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide? Why is that? And I question whether that wonderful substance, carbon dioxide, which is plant food, has Mm. really anything to do with the climate because we have seen for the last... 542 million years. It was a Tuesday, 542 million years ago when we started to get complex multicellular life. Sure, it was a Tuesday. It was definitely... Oh, no, sorry, it was wrong. It's a Thursday, Thursday. because it was named after the, the god of thunder, Thor. Huh. So we'll go for the Thursday. But that's when animals started to grow shells and take carbon dioxide out of the oceans, which had dissolved from the air. And 470 million years ago, again, incredibly on a Thursday, we started to see land plants and they started to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. And so for the last 500 million years, the atmosphere has been decreasing from 0.7% carbon Mm. dioxide Mm. to the current level at 0.04%. We're actually in a long cycle of decreasing carbon dioxide. If we halved it, we would lose all plant life on Earth. Now, Patrick Moore is a friend of mine who uh, started Greenpeace. He wasn't a friend then. Um... And he got kicked out of Greenpeace by the communists who took over. Mm. Patrick Moore is a, a, an ecologist, a plant ecologist, argues that it is our environmental responsibility to burn as much oil and coal as possible. To feed to put the plants. carbon dioxide yeah. back in the atmosphere and feed yeah. plants yeah. to stop the plants dying. So for the last 500 million years, we've been decreasing in atmospheric carbon dioxide. We pulled huge amounts out between 300 and 250 million years ago to form the big coal deposits and then mm-hmm. we didn't have the bacteria that chewed up vegetation and rotted it, so it just accumulated. And for the last 50 million years, we've been cooling. We've been in an ice age for the last 34 million years. We've had six ice ages in the history of the planet. Six out of the six started when there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. So it's just not possible. So it's, a lot, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of rubbish, but they don't want to listen. In fact, they would like to shut you up because uh, you obviously know your stuff and they, there's nothing they can really do. Knowledge knowledge is uh, an amazing thing. It can confront all the ignorance of these people and, of course, the journalists don't have the knowledge to ask the questions. You know, I read somewhere that um, uh, our emissions were 33 billion tonnes. Of that, half is absorbed by the forests and grasslands of Sorry, Australia. you're wrong. Uh, I published an article in The Spectator on this and I showed that there's ten times as much absorbed in, us, in Australia than we emit. That absorbance includes our grasslands, yeah. our rangelands, yeah. our crops, our forests, yeah. and most importantly the continental shelf, which is part of Australia. Canada does the same. It absorbs more than it emits. Surprisingly, the US does the same. It absorbs more than it emits. And then I've done the calculations for the planet. The planet absorbs more than it emits, and that includes China. And what this is telling us is that the bulk of the world's emissions, which we know anyway, come out of the oceans. So these are heresies which people don't want to face up. And there's nothing anybody can do about the oceans. I mean, that's well, there's nothing no, to do with coal um, mines. No, it's, <coughs> we've had the oceans doing for a very long period of time and when people talk about the Amazon being the lungs of the planet, that's just one of these feel-good statements. Mm. It's absolute rubbish. The lungs of the planet are not the Amazonian trees which you want to hug and kiss. Mm. The lungs of the planet are green slime living in the ocean. If you really think that's important, go and hug some green slime. <laughs> I'm sure we get some people in Canberra who would have a who would have a go at that. Well, you can't hug yourself. Well, no, 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 no. 
I suppose you can't. Well, I'm talking about green slime hugging green slime. <laughs> but what, 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 what are we going to do about the, uh, the misinformation and all the damage that that misinformation does? All the climate change, we're obsessed with that and the voice, taking up all of the time and energy, uh, while all of the big problems are just ignored. Cost of electricity, cost of living... Uh, I think with climate change, I have always argued it's never going to be uh, the science. It's an anti-environmental movement. You wouldn't chop down oceans. Uh, sorry, you wouldn't chop down huge forests in rainforest in Queensland. You wouldn't destroy prime farmland for renewable energy. But we did a story uh, last... This is the second uh, Friday that we've been doing this live streaming thing. We did a story last week, Caroline would remember it, where in Scotland they cut down 7 million trees, more than 7 million trees, uh, because they wanted the uh, area to be... Uh, for uh, wind turbines. Yeah, we're doing the same in far north Queensland. Exactly well, what, 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 oh God, so uh, the climate change movement has got nothing to do with science. It's got nothing to do with the environment. It's got everything to do with unelected people, yeah. faceless people having power over you. And the end result of it is your electricity bill has gone up. If you work in a foundry, the chances of you losing your job are very, very high. It's going to create unemployment and massive costs. So this has got... All to achieve nothing. Uh, they achieve nothing because we have already got a very efficient power system. We've got a very, very efficient um, um, grid system. And it's a bit... Well, your love is cars. Now, a T-model Ford is recognisable as a car because it's got an internal combustion engine, brakes that sort of work, and mm. a steering wheel. Sort of. And compared with a modern car, you know, mm. a, a roller or a... Uh, Maserati or Bentley or something, you can still recognise it's a car, but the engineering is so efficient that they are very fast, extraordinarily fuel efficient. Now, the same has happened with the electricity system. We've gone from a primitive system to a very efficient system and we, we can balance out the load very easily. That can't happen with green energy. So what we've got is uh, renewables, and the only thing renewable about the renewables are the subsidies. Nothing else is renewable. Um, <laughs> it's ruinable <laughs> energy. It ruins uh, pastoral land. It ruins uh, ag good quality agricultural land. Wind turbine blades, you have to feed communist China to buy these things. Then you've got to chop down balsa trees in the uh, Brazilian Amazon forest to get the balsa wood to make a laminated blade. You hold those together with a resin. The resin's got a chemical in it called bisphenol A, highly toxic, banned in most countries. This is why you can't recycle turbine blades. This is why they get cut up and dumped in the soil uh, to leach out into soils and yeah, into yeah, the water. Well, that's the, the story last week about the, the fact that yeah, they Nick, were Nick dumped in a forest. In Queensland found this, this quarry mm. with all these turbine blades dumped there. That, yeah. And it was apparently a holding place where they're going to be there for a short period yeah. of time. Cheetah you know, had some pretty substantial vegetation growing. I'll on pass it. that over. The 16 million trees they cut down for the turbines. Uh, well, 16 million trees, and, and, and they, I mean, I, I think of my little rainforest across the way, and uh, I, I love to look at that and think that it is indeed producing oxygen and absorbing CO2 and, and doing something which I, I think is beneficial for the planet. Well, that's where Patrick Moore is right. Uh, Patrick Moore says that we should be providing plants with plant food. Mm. And uh, CO2, yeah. And that's carbon dioxide. Mm. Now, we've also got an attack on other fertilisers like the nitrogen fertilisers. Now, in this country, Australia, we have a serious problem. We don't produce nitrogen fertilisers. We have one small plant that does it, but that company's under financial stress because the nitrogen fertilisers are coming in from Russia. Mm. They're much, much cheaper. Now, if we didn't have nitrogen... We couldn't actually have fertilisation of crops, and there are four things important for modern Western civilization: steel, concrete, plastics and nitrogen fertilisers. Now, we are attacking uh, steel because when you convert iron oxide into iron metal, you have to take away the oxygen, and you do that by putting in carbon compounds like coal, mm. and out comes carbon dioxide. Um, there is no other efficient way of making steel. You can make steel using hydrogen and other things, which are no, no, no. very expensive. No. Plastics, well, we use about 6,000 chemicals yeah. 
every year in our life that derive from um, oil. If you've brushed your teeth this morning, and I'm sure, sure your listeners have, if you brushed your teeth, you've used about half a dozen compounds mm. that come out of um, oil. So we have to use uh, oil. We we use plastics, and yes, we can make some plastics from plants, but we live in a plastic world. Mm. And where would we be without concrete, something the Romans invented and some of the Roman concrete structures, the marine concrete structures are still standing. It is a wonderful material. It's cheap. It's easy to mould into how you want it. So we live in a world where every single component of that world is being attacked. Now, I'm quite happy for people to question that, but they have to lead by example. And when I see our greens living in caves and having seven unsuccessful days of hunting and gathering and then telling us that we should be living that life, Mm -hmm. I might actually listen to them. Mm -hmm. But until then... They're not worth listening to because well, they're hypocrites. What, what they want to do, it would seem, without logic, is to turn the world, which uh, we have uh, come to know, upside down. And they're doing it without any scientific reason. And they're... without any responsibility. Huh. It's very easy to Well, they never come idea. back and apologise because they've all, got a lot of things wrong. And I know from the scientific work that I've been doing that um, in one particular area where I've spent about 50 years of my scientific life and that's working in the Broken Hill area or mainly inside the ore body of Broken Hill, it's very, very hard to come up with, with an original idea. Someone 50 years ago or 30 years ago or 80 years ago thought of it. Now, it's the same in technology. It's the same in all branches of science. Someone has thought of it before. Someone said, oh, this looks interesting. I'll give it a go. Mm. So uh, science is a path of failures. And the failures that we are repeating are quite scary. For example, we tried electric cars in the 1830s. Mm. They failed Mm -hmm. for the same reasons they failed in the 1920s, for the Mm -hmm. same reason Mm -hmm. they're failing now. They're too heavy. Uh, You have to fuel them up too much. And the cost of the components is enormous. And no thought given as to what you're going to do with the batteries, even if you can afford to replace the battery, very expensive. Uh, every 10 years, what are you going to do with recycling the old batteries? No, it's worse than that. Um, you use six times the amount of metal to make an electric vehicle compared with an internal combustion vehicle. Mm. Now, that metal has to come from mining. Uh, most of the metal used is copper. We have found all the major copper deposits sitting at the surface. We are now finding them at depth. Most Western countries do not allow exploration and mining and have so much regulation that delays uh, anything up to 25 years. So a lot of the exploration now is being done in the third world. And so if you're mine, uh, driving an EV, what you're doing is having people put massive great holes in the third world, which are bigger and deeper than any other holes anywhere else. They're massive tailings piles, massive tail piles of waste rock. You are actually... you. By driving an electric vehicle, you have to be a huge supporter of the mining industry. The second thing is that the cobalt in your electric vehicle, most of it comes from the Congo, where it's mined by black slave children Children, in open pits and in underground mines, they get killed. So when you're swanning around in your electric vehicle feeling really good, you must be feeling good because of the slave children that you're killing in, in mm. the Congo. They don't want to think about that because the media <laughs> doesn't want to. Not they don't all. want to talk about it. And then, of course, they are an incendiary. You can't put out an EV fire. They're very, very hard to put out. And uh, we know now that insurance companies will not be insuring um, EVs on ships and will not be insuring EVs in parking areas. Mm. They won't be doing it. So... That's a problem. There are many apartment blocks which are just not wired to be able to have people charging their EVs. And I know one person, for her EV, she's got to drive somewhere to charge it up. Mm. And then she's got to wait in a queue and waste hours. Now, the the aim of the exercise Mm. is to be efficient. EVs are not. And you mentioned the other point is they lose value like you wouldn't believe. You've only got to touch the engine underneath. They are not the technicians to repair it. So, great idea. It's been tried before. It's failed for the reasons it's failing now. Yeah. I I saw the other day that uh, Volvo uh, have scrapped their traditional vehicle, their their sedan or their estate car. They're now only going to build uh, SUVs 
and uh, electric ones at that. Wouldn't you think a company as sophisticated as Volvo would not be kind of conned into the the the, the, the folklore or the, the well, whatever the Volvo? It's my rally car. It's a mm-hmm. 1965 122S. That's a very good car. Uh, it's you have one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, oh, last rally I went on, I did 10,500 kilometres in 10 days. My co-driver is Doug Sprig from Arkarula. He's a bit slow for me, but uh, yeah. it, it's, it's a fabulous car. Now, that was built to thrash, and you've got to drive that car like you stole it. <laughs> and, and it's just a magnificent vehicle to drive, and that's when they designed cars properly. Yes, yes. It's as uncomfortable as hell after 10,500 kilometres. We've got yeah. another rally coming up in the Flinders Ranges early next year. Now, that's a real Volvo. When they started to build the hearses, yes. uh, <laughs> get yeah. away. Now, yeah, yeah. that's one I've got, a, I've got a P1800. Oh, uh, I, love, I love them. It's a beautiful yeah. shape, I isn't it? Them. I love them. The Saint loved them. Yeah. I've got the same engine, the same gearbox. Yes, I've taken yes. out the electric overdrive. What is it, the B20 engine? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And absolutely beautiful. And that, that's, that's my, that's my uh, Volvo. I've got a, a diesel Merc, which I use around the town, and I've got a, a car made in crew in England. Oh, yes. Um, which is my uh, long distance driving car. Last week I drove um, Broken Hill to Melbourne. What, what is that? Is it a Rolls? No, it's a Bentley. A Bentley. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 Continental yeah. GT Coupe. Oh, lovely. Uh, it's a car. Now, you, 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 you're a car lover. I know it. I've seen them in your garage. I've, I've had a lot of cars in my life. I've never driven anything like the Bentley. And I so, only keep it for long distance yeah, drives. Yeah, yeah. But, but so, so a sophisticated company that, uh, well, I know that there's a, a Volvo P1800. Not an E, but a P eighteen hundred. Um, I think it has got uh, three million miles on the clock. Mm. The guy makes a living going around with the car, uh, talking to people. Yes, and Why it's, not? it's, it's, it's a not well. It's a car. It's done three million yeah. miles. Yeah. Now, if, if you had that kind of success, why would you want to go down this rabbit hole exactly right. of electric cars? Well, also the modern internal combustion engine is. Phenomenal. Yeah. Now, in the 2,000 kilometres I drove from Broken Hill to Melbourne to Adelaide, I got 7.7 litres per 100 kilometres mm. in a two-tonne V8 Bentley. Yeah, yeah. Beat that. I mean, the engineering is just superb. Yes. So why change a century of engineering mm. to go down the EV path? Well, particularly if you, you can't demonstrate that it is an advantage or an improvement. <laughs> Look, and there's a lot of woke people floating around in Scandinavia. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not very woke. I've spent too much of my time in the bush. And, no, you're yeah. too sensible. And, God, I, I, you, you, you have been a teacher, haven't you? Well, I, I've worked in universities. I've been a university chair for 30 years. And at other levels in universities, I took a bit of time out in the middle to work in the mining industry, uh, and then I finished up at the University of Adelaide in beginning of 2012. You've been so good in a, in been, a classroom or a lecture Oh, hall. I love teaching, and this is the one thing I miss. I, I miss having 300 kids in front of me, yeah. and you're struck in, and you can see them saying, what the hell is you going to go on with about today? And I, uh, all my lectures are politically incorrect. But, <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, the kids remember those things. Yeah. But and, the- and while I'm on that, um, self-promotion never goes astray. No. While we're talking, uh, I'm having another book printed, or well, it's three books actually, and the first one, um, it, the, the three of them are called the Little Green Book. It's a bit like Mao's little oh, yeah, red I, book. I stole it, but the, <laughs> the Chinese are stealing, so I might as well steal from them. Oh, yes. And the first one is for eight to ten-year-old kids, and I look at Brilliant. the carbon cycle, and I look at how kids might eat a cookie and the, what happens in their body to convert it into poo, wee, fart, snot and boogers. <laughs> and I have a lot of, uh, in the book about farts because <laughs> I know how eight-year-old kids think and I actually rotate... Uh, eating, farting, and climate change, um, showing that... You're talking their language. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. talking their language. And <laughs> if if you want to be a supporter of this mad climate change idea, then you have to stop farting. Yeah. And to do that, you've got to glue up your bum. And then <laughs> the second book is for teenagers. And uh, t- now I know from having my own kids and having teenage grandkids... 
the words I often use is, oh, that's not fair. Nothing's fair. The fairness <laughs> of driving an EV yeah. and kids in the Congo dying. Yeah. Providing you the oh, don't world. mention the kids in the Congo. Or a third of the kids in the world <laughs> have house cooking and heating done by dung and twigs and leaves and they die of respiratory diseases. So mm. I go in, it's a basically a moral challenge to teenagers. Mm. Well, Pol Pot had that idea to sort of take uh, society, kill all the, oh, yeah. kill all the professors yeah. and the intellectuals yeah. and, and <laughs> go back to a peasant society. Yeah. That didn't really work terribly well, and, did it? And, and the third book is basically a summary of my first few lectures at university just on the history of the planet and showing how we've always had climate change. They've been massive, rapid, not related to carbon dioxide. No, no, no. And Connell Court is my publisher in Brisbane. Uh, I, I, I've had 15 books published now and I, I will not have a book printed or published outside Australia. Oh, the, bless the, the printer is in Brisbane yeah. and um, it's being released at the CPAC conference in Sydney on the 19th and 20th of August. So I can't, I can't tell you. This is a book for parents and grandparents yep. to actually deprogram the crap that their kids get fed. And they get fed in the classrooms That's and they right. have, they've got a, they're questioned on it and examined on it. That's right. And they have to accept it as being gospel. Well, what, what is the worst part about that is that kids, a lot of kids know that this is wrong. Yeah. And these kids are being taught to lie. Mm. So we're teaching kids in the education system, if you want to get a good mark, yeah. you have to lie. That's just... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right. we, we need you either in, in the lodge or we, we need you running the university, the education department. <laughs> I'd I like mean, to be in the lodge. It'd be nice to garden there and cut the grass. And you wouldn't have, have the time. The dogs no, no, you wouldn't have the time. Let the dogs run around. No, your job would be to straighten out Canberra. And, uh, you know, you'd... Well, I'm a great believer in drain the swamp. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, in Canberra we now have fourth generation people living in Canberra. Or prick the bubble. Um, and in Canberra it's a perfectly good sheep paddock to destroyed by politicians and public <laughs> servants. And there's an iron, yeah. the perfect solution to that. Shift the Department of Aboriginal Affairs to Tennant Creek. Oh, Shift the yes. Department of Infrastructure to <laughs> Mammoth Flat, where there is no infrastructure. <laughs> Shift the Department of Climate Change to Queenstown in Tasmania. They, they don't know what climate's about. Yeah, Shift yeah. the Department of Agriculture, say to um, Zagaminda or, or something They don't like want that. to know. Well, you, you can't, you know. You would achieve three things. The first is that most of them wouldn't go, so you'd reduce the number of people in the public service. Yes, yes, the second yeah, thing yeah. is they would be in contact with people that they're dealing with, that should be yeah, dealing with yeah. in their everyday life. And the third thing is you'd get better policy. Yes. So um, I, I, would, I would love to be the king of the world, as we all, we all dream of being king of the world and how we come <laughs> through like Alexander the Great and cut the Gordian knot, but... Um, well, if you, if I'm too old for politics now. I've missed it, and some of my old girlfriends are still alive. I'm not so sure I should be in politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, Minister, I don't know whether you were a fan of. Yes oh, I love it, and in my Bracken Hill yeah. house, I have every Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, and when yeah. I come up from underground, I come out from the bush, and I'm. I'm, I need to put my feet up. I'll put it on and watch it because there's nothing to watch on free to air television. No, no, and, no, no, no. You know, it's no. so relevant today. And that program was done 40 years ago. But it was a comedy, and in actual fact, it is a tragedy, not a comedy, <laughs> because it is a, so absolutely bloody true. Well, I've met Sir Humphrey Appleby types. Oh, yes. <laughs> and they're just untuous. Yeah. And, and, and they give you this facile smile of, oh. Terrible. Well, bless you, sir. I, I, can I keep that and plug that it? That is for you. Well, um, I'll, because I'll plug it regularly. I, I'm concerned about the young people getting <sighs> child abuse at schools. They get it from weirdos telling them about gender bending. They uh, get it about climate. They get it for, about the Aboriginals. They get it on everything. Yeah. Yet they can't read and they can't write. Oh, well, you don't, don't want to do novel. the basics. Yeah. Don't and, do the basics. And, and uh, there's, there's not even any naughty books around. I, I was only thinking when I was naked in the shower yesterday, thinking <laughs> of some of the naughty books that I read as a younger person yeah. to get Lady Chatley's Lover, yeah. which wasn't a book about sex. It was a book about class differences. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. to get that, you yeah. had to get that in an unmarked envelope that came from England. Same with uh, was that to one read Port 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And I was thinking of that and I'm thinking, no, that, that, that's a, a, a book of great Jewish humour. Mm. And 
kids don't read any longer. No. So they get this porn shoved down their neck yeah. at school, be it climate porn, be it gender porn or sexual porn, and I fear for the next generation who will not be able to think analytically and critically, who will not be able to reason and will not be able to pull up an argument apart by basic threads. And so that's why I've written this trilogy, mainly for parents and grandparents to unstitch the rubbish that their kids are being fed. And whether it's at a private school or whether it's at a, a, a state school... That's the same still thing, I know, I know. Fed this rubbish. Thank you, sir, for being there. May you always be there. I, I just wish I could get, get you bottled or get you in pills or something. Well, and thank you for put having me. You, put the essence of Professor Plymer <laughs> in the water supply. I don't know where we'd start, but thank you, sir, for yeah, coming. Thank you for inviting me. Will you me. come back again? I will. It's, it's about a four-minute walk from my house to your place. Wonderful. <laughs> or a two-minute drive in the Bentley. Uh, no, no, no. That That's locked in the garage. Uh-huh. And I only keep that for long drives. What colour is it? It's burgundy coloured. Ah, oh, lovely, got, lovely, uh, lovely. the hard top without a sunroof. It's got uh, white leather. Yeah. And the Japanese Tamo ash. It is beautiful. Yes. If you invite me again, I will bring it down here and you can have a... But only on a nice sunny day. Actually, it, well, I'll have to polish it then, won't I? <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't get it wet, though. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, you're, you're a man of machines. I've never driven a machine like this. Mm-hmm. And, and, and 0 to 100 in 3.7, 0 mm-hmm. to 250 in 9.8. Wow. I, I won't go the maximum speed, which is 320. I, my eyes and Launch reflexes speed. are not good <laughs> enough. And if I do that in New South Wales, they crush cars, don't they? Oh, they no, 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 no. <laughs> I can't even think of it. <laughs> Professor Plymer, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. God bless.